going to be diving into the thrilling topic of oligopoly. So what is oligopoly? First of all, it's another example of a market structure in imperfect competition, but oligopoly is a market structure in which there are only few sellers offering similar or identical products. The name itself refers to competition amongst the few as opposed to uh, monopoly where it's competition amongst the one, and it's different from monopolistic competition because of monopolistic competition the products aren't the same, they're nuanced from one another and distinguished from one another. But that's kind of hard to visualise. There are definitely some examples out there that we can relate more to our own lives, such as... Um, an easy, famous one would be the chocolate industry in the European Union, which is dominated mainly by Cadbury, Mars and Nestle. And even though there's such a large market, um, these firms are so large and dominant, and they're able to influence the quantity of chocolate bars produced, and given the market demand curve, the price at which the chocolate bars are sold. It's also the case within the US with Hershey's and Mars as the dominant firms. Jesus. That kind of plays into like a really weird conspiracy in that like every market within the world or like economies in general are all oligopolistic. Like say there's the belief that modern capitalism capitalism is dominated by a select group of elites in that like the concentration of like ownership and of capital means that like the few control the market with the many, which is like obviously a very broad expansion on the idea of oligopoly. But it does in some ways its own merits. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but then I guess it's like also handy to break it down in the more economic terms of like what are the main characteristics of an oligopolistic market? Yeah. So the first characteristic would be that there's few firms in the market. Uh, the main characteristic of um, a relatively small number of dominant firms in the market. Each firm may offer a product similar or identical to the others. For example, in the UK there are many thousands of firms selling groceries, but the supermarket industry is dominated by four very large firms. Uh, Tesco, same for same for these, Morrison's and Asda. Yeah, and then there's also the idea of differentiation, which is that the goods that firms sell are close substitutes. So the firms will engage in kind of advertising to persuade consumers to buy their product rather than a competitor's product. Wherever the scope for advertising may be limited, where the good being produced is very similar, like petrol. Um, they may also kind of differentiate their actual products. So then, like all beers are arguably similar, but some might be light in calories. Or market segmentation is another example. And this is the breaking down of customers into groups with similar buying habits or characteristics, such as Procter and Gamble, who produce different household care products for different customer needs. Uh, and then there's interdependence, which is that one firm has influence over the others, and each firm may or may not react to the decisions of others. So each firm in the industry will be considering its actions, but its behaviour will be influenced by what it thinks the actions of its rivals will be. So as a result, the firms may come together to effectively kind of act like a monopoly, producing a small quantity and charging a price above the marginal cost. Collusion is illegal um, in many countries, including Ireland, and all the oligopolies can also act within their self-interest as all they care about is product profit. And finally, there's competition and collusion, as you previously said. And um, oligopolies uh, may form an agreement to work together. Such an agreement among firms over production and price is called collusion, and the group of firms acting in unison is called a cartel. Uh, once a cartel is formed, the market is in effect uh, served by monopoly, and we can apply analysis assuming monopoly. Although oligops, oligopolists would like to form cartels and earn monopoly profits, often that is not possible, mainly due to competition laws which prohibit explicit agreements among oligopolists as a matter of public policy. In addition, squabbling among cartel members over how to divide the profit in the market sometimes makes agreement among them like virtually impossible. Yeah, but that's like a really intense amount of information to yeah. bomb all over once. But I guess we have to break down how you view oligopolies into like a very kind of handy theory. Yeah, such as the game theory, which is the study of how people behave in strategic situations. And by strategic, we mean a situation in which each person, when deciding what actions to take, must consider how others might respond to that action. Because the number of firms in an oligopolistic market is small, each firm must act strategically. In making its product decision, and each firm in an oligopoly, in an oligopoly should consider how its decisions might affect the production and decisions of all other firms. The easiest way to kind of envision this is through an adapted version of the Prisoner's Dilemma, taken from a tutorial of ours. Shout out to Laura and Gaia. <laughs> So welcome to the adapted version of the Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, this dilemma is uh, based on the like hypothetical scenario, where say we submit our project, we get 70 out of 100 happy days, 
Um, but then there comes about one or two issues. In the first instance, it's that there's no referencing done throughout the thing, which is a minor offence. But then there's also the, the TA suspects that we have plagiarised over, which is a major offence. So she brings in Nile and Matthew and asks them to either confess or not confess to plagiarising the work. So within this matrix, we see the options that they have. If Niall doesn't confess and Matthew doesn't confess, they both get 50 and 50 on the project, and that's it. But then if Niall doesn't confess and Matthew confesses, then Matthew gets 0 and Niall gets 70. And then it's the same in reverse. If Matthew doesn't confess but Niall confesses, Matthew gets 70 and Niall gets 0. But then if they both confess, they both get 34 and 34, which is a fail. <laughs> So basically, the idea within all of this is that there is the optimal outcome for them both, the 50-50. But then they also have a dominant strategy that suits best for themselves, where if they just um, do not confess, then they can still stand to get 70 out of 100. So within this context, it's reasonable to assume that out of self-interest, they're going to pursue the strategy where they get the best mark. Which is the way that choose the best outcome for themselves is to both confess, which results with them getting a least optimal outcome of 34 and 34. Then if they opt to collude and coordinate, then they're going to reach 50-50. The idea is that in the first few instances of this game, they're both going to go for the least optimal outcome, because that's the one that's the most optimal for them, assuming they don't know what the other person's doing. But with enough repeated instances, they're eventually going to come to what is called a Nash equilibrium, which is where they choose their best strategy given what the other person's going to do. So they're both going to come up with 50-50 as opposed to 34-34. And that has been the prisoner's dilemma, but Thanks then how do you, but let's <laughs> retranslate that back into economics. And um, so the tension between self-interest and cooperation exemplified in the prisoner's dilemma is very similar to the tensions that exist between firms in imperfect competition, and particularly between olig olig oligopolistic firms. Oligopolistic <laughs> firms. <laughs> Game theory has been applied extensively to the uh, analysis of oligo oligopolies <laughs> <laughs> as a result. Consider an oligopoly with two countries. Both countries sell crude oil, and after prolonged negotiations, the country agrees to keep um, oil production low in order to keep the world price, price of oil high. And after they agree on uh, production levels, each country must decide whether to cooperate and live up to this agreement or to ignore it and produce at a higher level. Eventually they will reach the national equilibrium, like myself and Matthew in the previous dilemma, and offer the most mutually beneficial outcome. Mm. Perfect. But then that leads into the question of how do governments try and deal with these particular yeah. issues and why do they try and deal with these issues? So basically cooperation amongst oligopolists is seen as undesirable from the point of society as a whole, because it leads to production that is too low and prices that are too high, which is obviously not good for us, the everyday Joe. So to prevent this, policymakers may attempt to induce firms in an oligopoly to compete rather than cooperate. So essentially governments try to stop oligopolies from behaving like monopolies and encourage them instead to behave more like perfectly competitive firms. Uh, given the long experience of many European countries in tackling um, abuses of market power, um, it is perhaps not surprising that competition law is one of the few areas in which the European Union has been able to agree on a common policy. The European Commission can refer directly to the Treaty of Rome to prohibit price, price fixing and other um, restrictive practices such as production limitation and is especially likely to do so where a uh, restrictive practice affects trade between EU member countries. Yeah, so the EU competition policy is like a set of rules intended to ensure <coughs> free and fair competition between businesses in the EU. Um, it aims to ensure the EU consumers get like, quality products at reasonable prices. So, say for example, it ensures that businesses must genuinely compete with each other and are not able to allow to collude or form cartels. For example, in 2007, so Drummond dealers were convicted of price fixing cars and accessories. The agreement was policed by the Secretary of the Sir Drummond Dealers Association to effectively eliminate it. Then there's another example where it's like businesses in a dominant position in the market cannot abuse their power by increasing price or trying to stop competitors from entering the market. Say for example, HBI ice cream was found guilty of abusing its dominant position when it offered retailers free freezers, but only allowed them to choose for HP products. These are violations of the EU uh, competition laws, and therefore there are interventions to uh, stop this and reintroduce the competitive aspect back into um, a non-populistic market. Yeah. However, there are some restraints to competition law, or antitrust laws as called. And the uh, objectives of antitrust laws include encouragement of fair businesses, competition and protection of consumers, and competing companies from anti-competitive business practices. 
Antitrust laws prohibit the unjust attainment of or conservation of monopoly power, and as well as the misuse of monopoly power to create a new monopoly and cooperative efforts among two or more companies to restrict entry into the market by others. So we can really see like the admirable efforts and admirable considerations that have gone into the actual like introduction of these policies. However, they can also result in negative consequences where they hinder an industry's effectiveness. Say for example, even in the case an oligopoly represents the most profitable outcome for its industry, government officials like, sorry, no, we might necessarily pursue that particular structure because it is inherently an oligopoly, even though it is the most profitable outcome. Then there's also the idea that uh, government officials in charge of enforcing antitrust laws may be pressured into enforcing them, um, which may actually damage the economic health of an industry. Then there's also the assumption behind antitrust laws that unrestricted competition is the ideal economic structure for both businesses and consumers. However, the results of unrestricted competition often lead to a small group of winners and a larger group of companies that fail to compete, um, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, because when a group or, of companies or a company itself comes to open forces in their industries, they can then effectively research all the industry practices again, even within the context of competition laws. Then there's also the issue, say, when there's an imbalance in the market or a perceived imbalance in the market. Um, Antitrust laws seek to kind of correct it, um, and they accomplish it by making uh, dominant entities engage in the same behaviour as they would in more competitive environments, such as charging lower prices, which can then lead to lower profits and inefficient outcomes as a whole, economically speaking. And that essentially summarises what is an oligopoly, how oligopolies can be viewed through game theory, how governments can try and intervene with oligopolies, and the pros and cons of government interventions. It's very good. If there's any more you want to read, we've got the notes done by Matthew as well, which will be in the description below. I'll have some links for further reading, but as a whole, I guess it's time for us to sign off and remind you guys that economics, it's about you.